Good evening, everyone, and welcome to RVing in New England. It is Wednesday, February 20th, and February is quickly disappearing. Let me call up my partner in crime here and see what he's up to this week. Hey, good evening, John. Good evening, Mr. Zagami. Uh, I'm coming to you from frigid Worcester, Massachusetts, and you are in warmer climes. Why don't you tell our viewers? Yeah, it's, uh, I am in uh, Pompano Beach, actually Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and uh, having lunch with a good friend of ours tomorrow, Marty Hanood, before I uh, fly back. And today it was uh, a brisk 82 degrees and sunny. Yeah, it was tough, tough, tough day in Florida. Yeah, well, we just got warnings about all this bad weather that's coming. But you know what? Luckily, in this particular storm, we're not going to get uh, we're just going to get brushed. But uh, you mentioned you're coming back tomorrow night right at the time where your car might be iced in at Logan. So it serves you right uh, for trying to rub it into us. Well, yeah, that's yeah. true. I forgot it was school vacation week and didn't really leave wow. enough time. And when I got to the airport, the parking was atrocious. And I wound up with one of the last three parking spaces on the roof of the garage. On the roof. And I said, you know, this this does not bode well. And then I only I made barely made the flight. I had five minutes to spare uh, in the flight. So did was, you have pre-check? Huh? You had pre-check TSA pre-check. Yeah, I, I did fortunately. Yeah, I did fortunately have uh, TSA pre-check. So yeah, that was, exactly. That was good. Mark Polk has joined us. Let me bring up our guest tonight. Another well, before, Mark. Before that. Before oh. that, let's let's talk about all the nice people we met this past weekend in Springfield, because um, um, you know what we we talk to them each week here, and they'll probably be on the show with us tonight. But it was yeah. nice, I thought. Um, at least I wrote this down in my pre-show notes to you know mention the fact that we saw the Swensons, we saw the Cavosas, we saw the Coles, and um, you know what? It was just nice to see these guys because you don't see them much during the during the winter. We missed them at the Boston show. Um, yeah, Mark, hang on, hang on a second, Mark. We I hit the button a little bit too early. We were still bantering. So yeah. if Mark Douglas has just joined us, but uh, Mark, I'll ask you to just bear with us a couple of seconds here. Mark, you can uh, banter you along. You can banter along. Yeah. We can. We can uh... Well, well, we we saw the Coles. We saw the Cavoses. We saw the Swensons. We saw Sherry Fuller. We saw probably ten or twelve of the Nerve the Dealers. It was a good show. I I, I suspect I haven't heard the numbers, but I suspect they either came close. To a record, or uh, maybe even broke the record because it was it was very crowded on Friday night when we were there. But I understand yeah. it was crowded all weekend. Well, you know what? One of our prior guests, the Foley's from Grafton, mentioned that um, it was so crowded they might not go again because they said you couldn't. You had to. You bumped into people everywhere you went, and yeah. that was yeah. Saturday. Now, you know, maybe they should have known Saturday. And when was the bad weather forecast for Monday? So they had Saturday uh, and Sunday, but you know that building, um, as big as it is, it's still not as um, user friendly, walker friendly, if you will, as Boston is, because Boston has the nice aisles and uh, it's set up differently. The, the Springfield building, although it's a great show, um, logistically, it's it's there's no right angles, there's corners everywhere, which kind of makes it difficult for people to. Uh, maneuver around the place. But hopefully we had a good show, and then we got the uh, Worcester show coming up this weekend. But let's get to our guest tonight. And uh, Mark Douglas, who is the CEO of the RVing Accessibility Group. We've seen Mark through the years at uh, various shows. Mark, welcome to RVing in New England. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. So uh, as I told you guys before the show and for the viewers, I am in a hotel in Fort Lauderdale, it is 82 degrees, so don't feel too bad for me. But uh, I had some technical difficulty earlier, and if I have a lot of difficulty, I may drop down and let John and Mark take the show. But let's let's hope Bob, not. And uh, Bob, we've go. already we've already uh, pulled a coup on that. We're gonna we're gonna mess up your internet so that we're gonna just take over the show. That's that's a good way to do it. Then I can be uh, talking, Anna. All right, so uh, Walter is saying that uh, attendance was down slightly Friday and Saturday, much higher on Sunday, but not sure what the numbers were on Monday. That's interesting because the Daytona 500 was Sunday. Uh, Jerry Plant's on from Cape Cod. Estelle Drew is on tonight. Good evening, Estelle. Uh, Walter, Ed Turco is on. Welcome, Ed. Good to see you on here. Uh, Don and Mark Polk. So we got a, we got a good collection. 
Mark, you've been a, a loyal advocate of accessibility and handicapped uh, motorhomes and RVs and, and also with ADA compliance for the campground. So why don't you give us a little bit of a flavor for what you do and more importantly, why you do it, because I know it's a volunteer position and I know you're dedicated to what you do. And tell us your story too, Mark, along with that. Well, yeah. I think that I think my story uh, led into doing what I'm doing now. Um, as a child, I grew up in and out of wheelchairs. So, uh, and then later in life, I encountered some situations that put me back in a wheelchair. But wheelchairs to me are like, I don't know, they're like toys, like an ATV. But that's only because I've used them for so long and so often that I, I've learned how to adapt. And most people do. Um, you know, so basically what happened was over the years, um, you know, we're all getting older. Nobody's getting any younger. And uh, in 2010, from 1997 to 2010, I spent most of my time trying to go RVing with a wheelchair, using the motorhome and a wheelchair. And uh, 2010, I got out of the wheelchair and uh, be able, was able to walk on my own again without assistance. And we had moved to the beautiful mountains in Southwest Colorado in Pagosa Springs prior to that time, built a we built a wheelchair accessible home because I didn't even, we didn't know if I'd ever walk again. And uh, so when it came to be that I could, I didn't know what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And having gone to so many RV parks, so many campgrounds with a 40 foot motor home that's not wheelchair accessible, using my upper body strength to jump down the stairs on my butt, to transfer to the chair, only to be stuck in gravel. I, I mm. honestly, I built up a big resentment toward the outdoor recreation industry, uh, the outdoor hospitality industry. And so I took that resentment and that anger and I tried to turn it into a positive. And that's when I started RV and accessibility group in December of 2011. And our goal was to try to raise awareness, bring education to the forefront, to help RV park owners and campground owners alike and other outdoor hospitality venues learn more about what their obligations are and how to become more accessible for a, actually the largest minority community in the United States, that being the disabled. So that's, that's how it evolved. Um, you know, I enjoy being out in the field. I enjoy taking the measurements. I enjoy doing all that information, but then it has to be put to paper. Mm -hmm. And that's where the task at hand becomes very cumbersome. But it is what it is, uh, and, and I've enjoyed doing that. So, Mark, let me ask you this question here. Um, when you say I've done the measurements and then the task at hand of, of implementing the changes, uh, that's not your job. That is the campground owner's job. Is that correct? Yes. Um, our, our responsibility to the campground owner is to bring to light all of their elements and issues that are out of compliance with the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act, and to help them understand how to, how to bring their park uh, back into compliance or into, not back into, but into compliance with the ADA it is their responsibility to take the action once they get the report to move forward with contractors and so forth to make those changes. Hmm. You know, one of the things that I've, you know, I, think I wrote some notes down here. Um, campgrounds by themselves are generally places where you go to a quote unquote escape the city. Okay. Therefore, when you look at trying to move a wheelchair around on piles of wood chips, and gravel and and dirt rutted roads that's a huge um accomplishment it's not the word a, a huge task to allow someone that is um accessibility denied if you will mobility challenged to um uh deal with it i'm not sticking up for the campground owners by any means but boy that that's a battle 
Well, that and that was one of the the biggest hurdles or challenges, if you may, that I encountered, and that my wife, who was my caregiver for those 14 years, encountered with trying to have a good experience. Because in our mind, our philosophy is it's all about the experience. And I think you would agree with that. When we go camping, it's all about the experience. We want to come away yeah. with a great experience. So we always, so we want to come back. Yep. And what I have found is that when I find a campground or a park that I can have that access to that, and I've had other park owners tell me after they've made improvements that they've had customers come actually in wheelchairs and say, and one is in Virginia, in Louisa, Virginia, small country campground. Bill won't mind me sharing this, but Bill had made some access routes to his uh, pavilion. He built one of the few 100% accessible miniature golf court courses uh, that I've seen in the United States. But he's had customers come to him and say, Bill, wow, I can't believe you've done what you've done. Why, did you, why have you done this? He said, well, because it needed to be done. Their response was, Bill, not only are we coming back next year, but we're bringing our family and our friends. Mm -hmm. That's a quote from Bill Small. Yep. You know, uh, in, in, would, in, in the sense of becoming ADA compliant, and we know there are, I don't want to say unscrupulous lawyers out there, but lawyers, when they find a, a vulnerability, this is something that, the whole outdoor hospitality industry, I hope, is addressing. But isn't it true that with the ADA compliance, you don't have to do everything. And I've, I've listened to your talks. So I know it's true. But uh, you don't have to do everything at once. But you have to start somewhere and explain that process. Because maybe maybe some of these campgrounds are sitting out there saying, I can't afford a hundred or $200,000. But there's, there's a process that you explain to get them on the road to compliance so that they don't get hit with these frivolous lawsuits? Well, just to kind of piggyback on that, on that idea, yes, the Department of Justice recommends a five-year plan. And they recommend that you try to start with small stuff. Five years from when to when, Mark? Five years from when they start, say 2019, to 2024, they would hope that by the end of five years, you've been able to budget and make as many improvements as you can. In fact, there's enough leniency by the DOJ to say, if you don't have it done in five years, make a secondary five-year plan, but they don't want it to drag on forever. So the, the first thing I tell park owners, you know, they have a fear. It's a big fear. It's like the ADA is like the IRS. They turn and run. You know, when they see me coming, they turn and run. But the reality is, you know, I'm here to help them. And some of the easy things they can do are like changing out door handles, changing out a threshold, uh, building a ramp. They're not that expensive. Uh, but if they, if they were to change like their door handles in year one, from a round knob to a lever action, yeah. Yeah. Which, which is called universal design, meaning that it's good for anybody. Anybody and everybody can do it, can use it. That's all they need to do for year one. Now, it doesn't mean they're not going to get sued. What that means is that if they have a plan in place and somebody does file a frivolous lawsuit, which they are, they're, they're out there and they are happening on a daily basis, they have a plan of action that should they need to use that it shows that we know what we got. We have a plan. Here's our five-year plan. Here's what we've done. And Sally Conway, who's one of the chief, uh, uh, one of the chief people at the U.S. Department of Justice, told me that there's a 99.9% .9 chance that case would, ever, would would be dismissed. It would never even get to court. Mm -hmm. So. Having a plan in place, it's 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 no it's no different than having a business plan. Okay. You know, Bob and your business and my business, we both have business plans. And so we plan our work and we work our plan. This is no different. 
Okay, but Mark, let me stop you for one second. You said just a few moments ago that if, if you do a little bit, 99% of the time, the complaint will be given away. Does that give the campground owner more time to um, just put it off and not get into the big bucks? Because, you know, I, I've been to a lot of campgrounds and there's such a diversity in the in the uh, the terrain, the contour. You know, is it a beach area? Is it a flat land? Is it uh, there's some oh man that we went to in Branson, Missouri, for example, that are built on the sides of mountains, and that's their attraction. That everybody's got a view of the valley. Um, but I, I'm wondering if number one, tell us is, is ADA a um, state enforced situation or is it national or do each areas have different response you know uh, uh criteria well it's a it's a federal mandate it's a civil rights act it's the largest piece of legislation under the civil rights act of 1964. it came into being in 1990 july 26 1990 um Terrain, there are exceptions. The book is 297 pages long, and there are exceptions in there that campground owners may or may not know about. And if you've got a terrain that is just not reasonably feasible to modify, then you can document that in your file so that if somebody does file a complaint, you've got it documented. But the key is you've got to document these things. So I run across campgrounds a lot of the times that have terrain challenged environments. And they say, well, how am I gonna build a thing on the side of the hill here? And I get these in regular municipality parks too. The, the, re, the, the, the bottom line is that yes, it's a law, but there are exceptions to those regulations that these owners need to know about so that somebody doesn't come in and falsely challenge them against something that's not challengeable, which mm -hmm. is a new word. Yeah. <laughs> and is it right, Mark, that, um, especially for a campground, but every site doesn't have to be ADA compliant because you're not going to probably never going to have a weekend where everybody in the camp is uh, handicapped or has some disability issues. So is there a percentage factor or can they put, two or three up by the clubhouse, which may be handicapped accessible next to the bathhouse, which could be handicapped accessible. Can they be in a, uh, an area of four or five that much like when we go to hotels and they're filled up and they say, all we got left is a handicapped room. I hate to take that. And they say, well, we're, we're booked for the night. So can you have uh, sites like that, that if they're handicapped accessible, then they're accessible to everybody. So if they didn't have anybody, renting that site that night, they could put a regular motorhome or a travel trailer on there. Hey, Bob, can you read Jerry's question or can you not see it from your computer? Jerry says, what's the goal? A percentage of sites ADA compliance? So it's kind of kind of similar to my question. Uh, you, know, you know, certainly every hotel room is not ADA compliant. There's a certain number. So if the hotel industry has, is there a percentage of rooms in a hotel and does that correlate to the percentage of campsites in a campground that should be ADA compliant? The answer is no. The hotel industry is completely different than the campground industry. An RV site presently is not mandated to be ADA compliant. So you can have no ADA accessible campsites and you, you'll be fine. Now there is, there are, it's called the new outdoor developed area guidelines that the DOJ came out with November 25th to 2013, which was dedicated for the national parks. But the state of California and the state of Hawaii have adopted those guidelines. So when I'm in California looking at RV parks, I have to use those guidelines because those guidelines say one out of every 25 sites needs to be accessible. And there's a, there's a, and, and then it goes two out of 50, three out of 75, two out of a hundred. And then there's a percentage over and above that. So those guidelines are state by state only. 
they weren't even meant to be state uh, guidelines when the, when the federal government came out with them. So, you know, and I've talked to a lot of RV park and campground owners, and this is a very, very common topic. You know, how many do I need to have? The answer is you don't need to have any. How many should you have? Well, you should have one or two, depending on how big your park is. And you use the, thir the theory of dispersion because you don't want them to be all together like a leopard, co leopard colony. Right. Okay. You put one right. over here. You put one over there. You put one over there. And it's, it's very important to train the people behind the desk to ask them, do you need a site near a restroom? They might not want to be near a restroom. Do you want a site that's near the dumpster? I don't want to be near the dumpster. So instead of putting somebody somewhere that they may not want to be, it's really important to understand what are they trying to get out of their camping experience. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you bring up an excellent point on that, Mark, but let, um, and I know we're going to come back to this in just a second, but the campground is almost secondary because when you look at most RVs today, and I wrote this down, RVs generally are not uh, handicap friendly. The access through the doorways is too narrow. The bathroom access is abominable. The, even the angles that you have to watch the TV at might not work. And access to the beds, you see some of these beds with the high, high mattress pads. Um, does your organization also deal with accessibility with uh, trailers and motorhomes? You know, we offer that service to the industry if they want it. Uh, we've reached out, um, you know, to that industry. And, and, and in many regards, they feel like they're engineering. Nothing against them, okay? I don't want anybody to take nope. this the wrong way. No. Nope. But they feel like their engineering team has got a good handle on it and their design team, and therefore they don't need any input from an accessibility specialist. And I will tell you, working in the real world, I see plans all the time that were designed and stamped for approval, only to find out they don't meet the ADA. Now, it's interesting, John, you bring this up, that a motorhome or an RV does not have to meet ADA standards, but there is the there is the reason of accessibility okay so the industry has, is trying has tried a few manufacturers as you know have tried to enter into this market it, it is a big market and uh, to that end 31.6 million people have a difficulty climbing stairs and walking I don't know how many of those people go camping but that would be a great market to try to, to try to tap into. Well, you know, Bob you know we, we've had um, uh, Newmar with the Canyon Star and Dutch Star and uh, Winnebago through the specialty vehicles group have had uh, motor homes that were available for people and Winnebago just recent now three production regular production motorhomes that are accessibility enhanced is what they call them. That's what that uh, unit is up there for, and they have the small intent. They have the adventurer in the gas model line, the Forza in the diesel line, and these are production motorhomes, and they just recently displayed them and the, they unveiled them actually at the Tampa Super Show. And I understand from people that we know in the industry that they actually sold several right at the Tampa Show. So they've hit a switch and this is a production motorhome. Now certainly need some other adjustments based on the uh, accessibility, but these, these are the units that they fully expect their deal is to put on the lot and stock them. And if they could take them to the Tampa Super Show, that probably gets about sixty or seventy-five thousand people. Sell four of them there, then that certainly should get the attention of Hiller 
to uh, have these in the lot. Had to uh, look at these units, observe them yet in person, Mark? I haven't looked at them in person. I've looked Can you hear me, at Mark? Can you hear me? I hear you. Okay. Yeah, uh, you're good. You're right. Okay, good. I looked at them on the internet. And I, I must say that I'm, I'm very happy to see somebody take the bull by the horns. It may not be perfect, but it's a start. At least somebody can now get in and out of their motor home, whereas before I had to scoot up and down on my butt. And for, for me, I will tell you that most people in chairs, not most, but a lot of people in wheelchairs have some use of their legs to some degree. Those that are full paraplegics depend on their upper body strength to be able to do things. One of the things that I see in the motorhomes that, and I was at the Hershey show, uh, I don't know, three or four years ago when Newmar brought their, their uh, uh, Canyon star out with the lift and they were very proud of that. And I went out and looked at it. And uh, the only thing that was accessible in that motorhome was the lift. Um, and I think that when you're trying to appeal to a certain segment of the marketplace that you need to engage in maybe, I know that one of the things that I think Winnebago has done is they've worked with a lot of people in wheelchairs and they've got a lot of advice that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way that that's the way to do that. But I think the other side of the coin is, okay, there's, there's maneuverability, there's turning radius, there's grab bar strength, not just a grab bar. It has to hold 250 pounds. Um, so I, I, I still haven't seen one in person. I would like to do that just to kind of do my own uh, looking just for my own appeasement. Uh, but at least they're, they're moving in the right direction. And I think that over time, we're going to see more and more improvements being made mm. based upon interaction with people that have purchased units. Mm. Hey, Mark, you brought up you brought up a very important word just a second. You said over time. Okay, we got a Let's look at something here right now. I think that many times people, when they hear the word handicapped or mobility uh, challenged, if you will, they they have a tendency to think of people that that were born with lifelong, uh, I, I don't know if disability is even a word that you can use, but a lifelong challenge, you know, whether it be polio, whether it be, you know, uh, anything else where, you know, they were, they were born with a, with an issue that they may never walk. Okay. However, and that's one group of people. However, today, when you look at the people that own the 40 foot diesel pushers, the, the older people, the people, let, let's so be, bold to say like an FMCA crowd, which is, which is not a 20 year old crowd. Uh, but I've been to those events where a lot of the people, you know, who've been motorhoming or, or RVing for 20, 25, 30 years are getting to the point just through natural health issues that they can't walk up those steps and they do need help with either a walker or some type of, you know, not the motorized wheelchair, but you know, some way to get pushed around. Um, um, well, there is a lot of them. When you look at FMCA, yeah, when you look at FMCA, it'll be interesting to see if Winnebago, and I, I assume I'd be very surprised if they were not exhibiting these same units at Perry, Georgia, um, week of March. It's the same week as RVX out in Salt Lake City. So March 11th, the week of March 11th is the FMCA rally in Perry, Georgia. But there's a lot of people that run around there in scooters, so they don't, they don't necessarily right. use their uh, wheelchairs. The scooter can go up on that uh, wheelchair lift too, and and many times, as as couples get older, and as Mark alluded to earlier, we will soon be there. We're not there yet, but right. as as people get older, one spouse may be disabled, but the other one isn't. So they they need to get them in there. But the other spouse is fully capable of driving and making breakfast and the coffee. So there's, there's other things they, they can do. But what I love about this idea is that it extends their RV and capability. And RVs are for fun and people have fun and they can travel. There's no reason why uh, a disabled community or pe population of people should not be able to enjoy the same things that we do. Uh, 
two gals in a Boston brew joined us from uh, Prescott Valley. I'm not sure. If, I think Laurie's still back here. I think Michelle's out there, but Michelle just put on a note. Uh, hi from Prescott Valley, where we are expecting 18 inches of snow tonight. I don't they, I don't know if they ever got 18 inches. Mark, you're, snow Mark, you're getting tonight. 15, right? We're getting 15. She's in Denver, Colorado. She's in uh, Arizona. Uh, Arizona. Now, Michelle, I'm sorry to hear that because I'm in Fort Lauderdale and it's 82 degrees. So don't feel bad for me, but don't call me nasty names either. Um, she also says with an accessible class A, we could actually take mom 86 and dad 90. Their age. God bless them on trips. Wheelchair and gets tired so quickly, but he could rest and enjoy where we end up. Yeah, he could be resting the whole way traveling. I'm sure many have parents that would need that accessibility yeah. to enjoy the travel with their children. That's another highlight. I'm sure it came into the Winnebago's thinking, but uh, yeah, just the ability to kids uh, in the RVing with this type of a, uh, they've got three in three different price ranges for what they have. Mark Polk says he used to sell handicapped accessible Hey Bob, Bob, you're breaking up. You're breaking up pretty badly. If if our audience, there was time around. We did have people? We had a up in New Hampshire here that would customize. Mark, do you hear and, and put a rail you're down the middle? Breaking up. Yes. Yep. So Bob, you're breaking up pretty badly. If um, I can I hear lost it. you, John. You're breaking up pretty badly, and I'm wondering if our audience could okay, just I'll, 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 type in is is Bob's voice. Right, I'll, I'll leave it. Yeah, you're breaking up pretty badly. Um, if our audience could tell us, is, is there an issue with Bob coming through um, on their computers as well? Just one or two people just to type that in. Right, I'll, I'll minimize. That would be great. Um, so, okay, those are the comments. Go okay, ahead, pick up Mark, what, is, what is the solution? Um, where, where do you see it going? Um, are you ready to throw your hands up in the air and say, the hell with this, I'm, I'm tired of it? Or do you, do you see progress that makes you say, I want to press on? Well, I, I see progress. Again, it's all about education, I think. I think that the more that uh, the dealers and the manufacturers are educated and get engaged, really engaged in this uh, market of uh, disabled Americans. And uh, one of the things that I, I'm going to digress a little bit here, but one of the things that I learned before I learned how to become an ADA consultant, you know, I, I went back to school after I got my legs back. I didn't just claim that title. Uh, so I, you know, anybody can, but I want you to know I have a tremendous amount of background and teaching to be able to do what I do today. Um, is that disability etiquette is important, I think, for everybody to understand that if I'm in a wheelchair. D define what you mean by disability etiquette. Okay, disability etiquette is how do you address people with disabilities. It's, it's a language barrier between the able-bodied community and the community of disabled. And, in fact, I'm going to be giving a presentation to our town council and our, our community here of architects and contractors here uh, in April to try to help them understand that if I'm in a wheelchair or Bob, you're in a wheelchair or John, you're in a chair um, or whatever it may be, you're not handicapped. Okay. What's handicapped is the environment that we live in. We are disabled. We are Americans with disabilities. Okay. We need to change that way of thinking. The thinking, the thought process. Don't tell somebody, do you want a handicapped site? No, I want an accessible site. I want a site that I can have accessibility with. Because it's it's just, it's just it's the nomenclature that we use. A lot of times when we talk about disability etiquette, the two things that are most important that were most important to me when I was a child in a wheelchair and when I was an adult in a wheelchair was my independence and my dignity. That's all I had. 
I didn't have my legs. So don't, don't mess around with my independence. Don't offer to help me unless I ask you to help me. Um, you know, don't push me in a different direction that I don't want to be pushed in. So just let me, you know, give me my dignity and my independence. One thing you mentioned, John, I want to talk about real quickly. And I, again, if I digress, bring me back online. We will. Is that we're talking about people that were born with disabilities and people that encounter becoming disabled. Yep. Yep. Good point. I have a very good friend of mine. I'm on the advisory council for persons with disabilities for the state of Colorado. It's a government governor appointed seat. And what we do is raise awareness. One of the members named John is a 51 year old single man retired from the air force injured in the air force. And he was an occupational therapist, which means he had to get the flu shot. Okay, had to get it. It was mandated. Seven years ago, John got a flu shot. Three weeks later, he lost the use of his legs. Two weeks later after that, he lost the use of his arms at age 44. His life changed for forever from being a karate instructor to a wheelchair user. These are the kind of people, and he's single, and he would love to travel this country but he doesn't know how he can do it without a wheelchair accessible RV. Mm -hmm. I even met some people in Gillette at an FMCA rally because I was working there to try to raise awareness and education. So you have, agree with me on my assessment of the FMCA crowd where it's an aging audience. It is. And, and so is, so is the, the good Sam crowd that, that right. they used to have the rallies to. Yeah. And, and I was asked to work a couple of those in 2012, by the way, by Sue Bray, because the Phoenix rally just blew apart because they didn't have, they didn't know how to deal with their elderly crowd and their crowd that had disabilities. So they brought me into Louisville and then they brought me into Daytona that same year and things went really well, but that's where I began to see. And then I went to Gillette that same year. Uh, and that's where I began to see people, that were older that may not necessarily need a wheelchair, but they're going to use a scooter. Mm -hmm. okay. And we should say here, when we say Gillette, you're talking about Gillette, Wyoming, because people in New England are familiar with Gillette stadium, the home of the world champion, New England Patriots. Six time. Six yeah, time I, world I know. Bob is back. Bob, yeah. you're cleared up. You, your, your picture cleared up. So maybe your voice is good too. Uh, did you hear that? Okay. Uh, and Ed, Ed Luterco is on, and he, he works with the uh, veterans of uh, the Lexington Veterans Association. He says that the disabled are not always visible disabilities. Well, that's true. But he brings up the other point that's very interesting. He says many state parks offer discounted admissions, fees, or passes for people with disability. Pass type D for disability, B for veteran, who have a state-issued disabled license pa uh, plate or placket. So they give them accessibility to the park, but if they don't have a uh, accessibility enhanced motorhome or trailer, then they're stuck with their car and, and probably uh, less than standard or less than acceptable services, even in our national parks. Uh, I know you do a lot of work with veterans too, uh, Mark. Uh, what are some of the things that uh, the veterans have done or that you've done to uh, educate some of the veterans groups? Well, you know, in talking with the veterans groups, one of the things is, is the invisible disability that comes to mind. But most of them, you know, most that I deal with are the people that have the physical, uh, visible disability uh, that has to do with mobility challenge. And a lot of them ask, you know, what should I do when I try to get in a business and I can't? Should I bring it to the business owner's attention? What's the best course of action? My advice to them is yes, talk to the business owner, advise him of the fact that you would like to engage in his business. You would like to buy some of his merchandise. And if you can't, you're going to go to the guy next door where you can. Mm. Um, so, you know, the veterans group, they're a, a very special group of people in my mind and my heart for what they've done and how they've served and the price they've paid. 
they deserve as much as anybody to have access and free access in and around the world, no matter where they go. The double-edged sword or the two-sided sword of this whole thing is the fact that people buy a wheelchair accessible enabled motorhome or RV. Mm -hmm. And then this just happened to me this past week. I got three emails from people and one with the Canyon star said, I've got this Canyon star 3911 for my husband. We don't know where to go camping. We're in a, we're in a California RV park right now, but we have to use a map because the site's not wide enough to accommodate the lift and then to be able to roll off the lift onto concrete instead of into dirt and grass. Or grass. So, I had, so I, and I had another one. I know I'm deviating here a little bit, but the no, it's, good, it's good information, Mark. The other one that I got was somebody that actually had a class C that had it modified, I suppose. They showed me a picture of it. They have a child that's 13 or 14 that's in a wheelchair in a wheelchair for life. And the question for them, for me was, you know, where can I go? Where can I take my child? I go to these RV parks. I don't have any access. I can't roll him to the playground. There's no access routes, which is the number one element in an RV park that they don't have is they don't have full access to all the amenities that everybody else gets to use and they all pay the same price. So like you mentioned state parks, yep. just in that sense, I also got a, I got a Facebook hit today from somebody when I made a post about the oxymoron, if you may, about buying a wheelchair accessible, and I'm, I'm just using that phrase, wheelchair accessible motorhome or RV, and then thinking you're gonna be able to drive all over the country and find all these places to go RVing and it's not going to happen and not as fast as we would like. And they said, and she said, by the way, I have a friend in Texas who's with the Texas state parks and we would like to know how to make our parks more accessible. What does that tell me? What does that tell you? That there's not as much a long way to go. I think there is. Mm. So what can we do as um, people that aren't in wheelchairs? Um, what, what can we do to help the cause? What can we say to campground owners when we check in? What, what can we post on our Facebook pages? What can we talk about at seminars? What can we bring up when we go to uh, the big uh, RVIA event next month? Um, who can we talk to there? Um, because, you know, my, my wife had hurt her ankle. It's, it's coming on, I think, three or four years or maybe five years now. But she said when she was on the crutches, she'd see these signs saying handicapped bathroom. And she said they it said it on the door, but they weren't. Um, who can we talk to? Who can the people that are watching this in the thousands that will be watching this um, spread your spread your message? Well, I think the, I think it begins with the owner. You've got to have a conversation with the owner. Have you had your campground assessed? Have you had it examined for ADA compliance? You know, they may not want to hear that question. They're not going to want it. They're going to put you in the worst spot in the place yeah, or tell you you're sold out. That's right. So, uh, you know, I guess the best way to, to answer that would be to say, um, if I could, you know, what I try to share with them is that there's a revenue stream out there that hadn't been tapped yet. And they're just waiting. They're looking for places to spend their money. And RV parks that have some kind of access, and some have more than others, you know, have you had an accessibility plan done? Avoid the word ADA. Have you, had, a, have you had an accessibility survey? Uh, and likelihood is they have not, okay? Um, Mark, is there, is there any program, uh, either through your organization or someplace else, should RVIC or any of these, you know, we've got five state directories, uh, state campground associations here in New England, but does Arbic have a designation for their parks that are accessibility enhanced for people that, you know, we're, so somebody buys that nice Winnebago motorhome and where do, sorry, where do they uh, go to see, you know, it, 
any uh, any of us that buy an RV, we, we look at campground directories. But our campground directories, are any of the state campground directories actually highlighting the parks that would be accessible? Some of them will. Um, some of them will not want to put on that liability. Um, if you say it is, it better be. Uh, and I see yeah. that one of the things I share with, and I did this with Coast to Coast and some other uh, campground membership organizations, in their directory, they have their legend, right? Mm -hmm. right. The legend says, okay, this means that, this means that. And they have the little ISA, the International Symbol for Accessibility, the little wheelchair guy, right? Yep. Yep. And they got that down there, that, which implies that they are wheelchair accessible. And I went, I was asked in 2012 and 13 to visit some of these parks to see if they were. And they weren't. So I, it's an unfortunate thing. I tell people, you know, don't trust the internet, you know, call the park, ask about accessibility, make sure they understand what you're asking about. Do you have some sort of firm and stable pathway from my RV site to the office? or to the playground, or to the to the, uh, the pavilion. Am I gonna be able to get anywhere I need to go in your park? This is a requirement by law. Am I gonna be able to get to anywhere in your park with my scooter or my wheelchair? The problem is lack of education to the people behind the desk taking the reservation. And I, I'll give you an example real quickly. On our way up to Gillette, Wyoming, we were going up I-25, and there was a big billboard that says we have oversized sites, handicapped sites. Okay, I said, we're going to go there and stay on the way. We pulled in. I went to the front desk. I asked the lady behind the desk because I knew she wouldn't understand the word accessible. So I said, I'd like to reserve a hand. I'd like to rent a handicapped site. She goes, what? We don't have any of those. I said, well, you got a billboard just down the road that says you do. So a lot of it is just lack of education and lack of understanding and maybe some advertising issues that need to be corrected. Hmm. Interesting. Well, uh, hey, Bob, I didn't, it, do my, uh, I didn't do my bit yet. Oh, you didn't. Go right ahead. No. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the reasons that we're able to provide a great show like this to you every week is because of – Viewers like you that take the time to share this message with other RVers and people that are considering RVing and uh, people that may be interested in the subject matter of this particular show. So on your device that you're watching at right now, somewhere down on the screen, there's a button that says share. So we'd ask you to either share it now or as soon as we're off to share it with your audience. And we do that and uh, we get three, four, five, seven, ten thousand 10,000 people a week that watch this show. So please take the time to share. And especially on a topic like this, the fact is um, if we live long enough, <laughs> you know what, this, this may be an issue for all of us to deal with. And I think that's so, one of the things that we'll, we'll, we have to take into account is the audience um, is growing in to this particular market and um you know again it's not just people that have been in a car accident and broken their back or people that um were born with mobility issues but we are all we should all hope that someday we live long enough to well, uh, and, and to mark's point earlier you know people are living longer now so there's going right. to be more people who need to have this accessibility later in life ed's got a good comment here he says I say again, it's good. I guess he thinks I didn't listen. To, I guess he thinks I didn't listen to him the first time around. Okay, Leturco, I get it. How hard are they actually looking at the ADA checklist just to review where they can start to be compliant? Should RV owners carry the list with them and just suggest to the motorhomes, uh, motorhomes and parks to consider compliance? That'd be an interesting. Uh, Conversation uh, when they check the manufacturers. Well, I, I think that's a good point, Bob, because the ADA checklist and Arvik has one on their website. Uh, I'm sure that others do too. Uh, but Jeff Sims with Arvik 
will tell you, and, and I've spoke at their national symposium uh, in 2014, uh, one of the things he will share with, with them is that the checklist is a checklist. It's a starting point. Is the ramp one and 12? Well, get your, get your little slide out, measure it, make sure there's one and 12. You know, uh, is the door pressure five pounds or less to open the door? Uh, is the threshold a half inch or less? So all these things in a checklist is a great starting point. John and, and Bob, that's a great idea because it gives them a little bit of an idea. Of, wow, I had no idea that there were so many things to look at. But one of the things Jeff says, and he reiterates, is that it's a checklist. It's not a plan. I call, I call transition plans. Uh, Arvid calls them implementation plans. Uh, the DOJ calls them transition plans. So we, we, we advocate to the fact to take that information, find somebody to help you do a plan, us or anybody else, and uh, turn that plan into action and then become part of your action plan. Now, Mark, when you, you said you've spoken at Arvik and, and uh, regional camping group, um, you know, professional associations, um, do you draw a crowd or is, are you speaking to empty seats? And is there um, comments coming from the audience or do they get the hell out of there as soon as they can so they won't be noticed? Well, it's usually a full house. Uh, probably one of the best ones was in New England, uh, where, you know, where they had nine states and uh, I was asked to be a speaker there. I think that was in 2013. I remember uh, that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 2014. Yep. Yep. That was yep. Yep. And, yep. and uh, phenomenal group of people, probably some of the best people I've ever met in, in the RV park campground industry. Um, and, and, you know, Pacoa was a really good one, had a full house. Uh, Missouri was a good one, had a full house. But we had one guy in Missouri say, why should I do this? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, 80, I'm 85 years old. I'm going to die soon. Why should I fix my park? <laughs> and, then he also, <laughs> and then he also said, I've never had anybody with a disability. And everybody in that room turned and looked at him like, are you, are you serious? Really? Excuse me. So, yeah, I mean, the room is full. Usually the question, the biggest question we get is about reservations. You know, if I if I build this really nice RV pad and I put concrete into it, and so I build a $10,000 pad or a $6,000 pad, which is about what they run, <clears throat> and I follow the new outdoor guidelines, how am I going to, keep that from somebody that drives up and sees that and says, I want to rent that site. And I always tell them, I said, well, it's like a, it's like a hotel. You need to have a reservation policy in place. So if somebody questions, why are you holding that? And you should also have a designation outside with a little sign that has a little ISA emblem yep. that designates the site, <laughs> an accessible site. But the policy would be similar to a hotel is that once we're full and this is up to the campground owner, we can rent that space. It's mm -hmm. their decision whether or not they want to tell them if we got somebody that comes in that needs that, that you might have to move. Well, that's you know, the, these hours uh, tend to pass quickly. We got about seven minutes left. Uh, couple of uh, things, Mark. What I'm going to do, because this has been very moving, and you know, even those of us who think that we're dedicated to this stuff and we work in it every day, uh, I can tell you that on our NERVD website, we do not have a single word about accessibility-enabled sites or campgrounds. So I'm going to give you a complimentary membership, associate membership in NERVD, and we will list you right along with all of our other associate members and I will am surprised that I have not had either a text or an email from Michelle who's out in uh, Arizona who is the behind the scenes genius for our Facebook page and our activities and our website but I'm sure I'll get one afterwards saying how come we don't have anything on our website so I'm going to beat you to it uh, Michelle and we will develop a uh, accessibility enhanced page on the website where we'll talk about and I'll, I'll work with you on what would be best to have there, but something so that we have it on our 
uh, state association for NERVDA. And then, you know, we can encourage the Pennsylvania and Texas and Arizona and say, look at this is, you know, we worked with Mark on this, Start and this is what we have. So that when people, you know, go to our website, they'll say, look at this, his, his information about uh, accessing the RV lifestyle, even if you are uh, disabled. Yeah. So I, I will commit that to you, and I'm sure Michelle will uh, follow up with me after the yeah. show. And I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but it, it's the accessibility thing is not just for folks that have had lifelong issues, but people that grow into them, you know, without a cat, without necessarily a catastrophic event like a car accident or a bicycle accident that that leaves them with challenges. But as you get older, mobility is absolutely a factor to uh, take into account. Am, am I thinking right, Mark? Yes, you are. I, I, and I, if, if, if it doesn't get addressed, and if we don't leverage that uh, to, the, to, the, to the level that we can, then we're not going to see a lot of change. But change comes by education. Change comes by word of mouth. Change comes by what Bob just offered to set up. And one thing to Michelle in Arizona, who I don't know, Michelle, but I do know Arizona. Arizona is one of our most proactive states of having accessibility assessments done since I've been doing this. So my hat's off to Arizona. Uh, and Texas was second. But the How other side Florida? of the point is Arizona gets hit the most. How is Florida? Well, she Florida, uh, you know, I've had, I haven't had any requests to come down there, but I've happened to go. When we did the Good Sam thing and we drove down into Daytona, we stopped at a lot of campgrounds and looked at them. There's a lot of good campgrounds in Florida. One of the issues we have, again, is the width of the pad. Most pads are around 14 foot wide in general. Right. Okay. The outdoor guidelines requires a 20 foot wide pad that encompasses all the hookups that allows somebody to get out of their motorhome with their lift, access around them if they're by themselves, mm -hmm. access around the unit, get hooked up, come back in, put the slides out, and, and go camping. Mm -hmm. I, I bring up Florida because you, you mentioned uh, Arizona and Florida. I think of two huge retirement states. They are, and, and I think Florida, I, you know, I, I, I wished I had the opportunity to look at more parks down there, but um, for whatever reason, it just hasn't happened. Um, Arizona's, you know, when I went to the Arizona Arvic conference, a state conference there, uh, we did a round table there. Instead of doing a presentation, we had like six round tables with 10 mm -hmm. people at each one, kind of like we did in New England. Yep. And, uh, it was it was easier to share with those people, and and ten owners said, "I want to do this. I want to get on board. I want to know how I can make my park more accessible." Right. And you know, I, something. Mark, are you uh, are you going to RVX in Salt Lake City in a couple of weeks? Uh, it's not in my plans. No. That's the. Um, how far are you from Salt Lake City? Uh, probably about maybe ten to twelve hours. Okay, I'll talk to you separately on that because I, I chair another group uh, in the industry that's called the RV Executive Council, and it's all of us uh, state directors for like Nervder in Florida, and, uh, Heather Leach up in Pennsylvania, Lance Wilson down in Florida, uh, and we have a meeting there. So uh, if you can't attend it, I will I will add this also to our agenda and make sure that they have a link to this show so that we can get the word out there a little bit more. Uh, so and Michelle says people people there are attuned to help. That's in Arizona, but don't don't feel like she's she's a transplant. She runs away from Massachusetts in the winter to okay. go to Arizona. Guys, there might be a silver lining to this, Mark, because with the bad weather that most of the country is experiencing tomorrow, Sagami might not be able to get back into New England. So if he has an extra day, if his flight gets canceled early enough, rather than hang around with Marty and uh, and his cousin Jack. He can maybe go around and visit a couple of campgrounds, take some pictures, and send it to you. That's it's a good well, point. You know, and that's kind of what we need. We need outreach. We need people that are willing. Actually, John, you, you hit on a point. We used to have 
I had some other accessibility specialists, but they found that it was just too hard to do. And well, you know, uh, but, but you know, Mark, we we've got these camp uh, these other sites out there like Campground Views, and uh, you know, they they take a lot of volunteer videos, and and because video is used so much in social media, that yeah, you know, we should uh, well. That's to have you back because we're coming up to eight o'clock and we don't like to abuse the time but you yeah. you've been a fantastic guest and you know it's a real serious topic and uh, and i thank you for coming on tonight but uh, we'll, we'll have you back and uh, we'll we'll do this again in a few months and and kind of update people on where you are and then you know john and i'll have a chance to talk to you in the meantime but as john said earlier please share the show uh, we thank you mark any closing words for our audience Remember, people in wheelchairs and using adaptive devices are not handicapped. They're disabled. What's handicapped is the environment around them. Good point. I want that, I want that on my page. When I do my page, Mark, I want that on the page. John, and, give you the closing yeah. statement here? Yeah, Michelle, you are correct uh, when I said Cousin Jack. You're the only one who got it, although the Pokes probably got it too. And I I'm got it. I'm sure Bob got it. But you know what, folks? We just want to thank you so much for uh, joining us. Please share. And uh, what's today? The uh, 20th or so? Of, you know what? It's only yeah. about six more weeks until April 1st hits and uh, the RV comes out of storage and we get to use them again in New England. That's it. All right, Mark, thank you. John, thank you. Good to see you. I'll be home. Hopefully, I'll be home tomorrow night and uh, won't have too much difficulty getting home once I get to the airport. So, We'll see yeah, you folks next week. Thank you very much for joining. Good night. Thank you very much.